I'm going to cover the last topic. I'm going to talk about soybean insects. And I, I'm going to go into detail on kudzu bug and tell you what we think we know about kudzu bug. But we, we sprayed soybeans real heavily last year, and I anticipate that next year we'll be spraying for kudzu bug pretty much over North Alabama, uh, not just along the Georgia line, but all across North Alabama, at least as far west as Lawrence County. Uh, doesn't leave much after that, but the um, kudzu bug is a very interesting pest. First one I'll talk about will be cutworms. Uh, this is going probably primarily going to be a problem on soybeans planted uh, planted in weedy fields and in pa in pastures. Uh, a lot of people will especially when they plant cotton, they'll put a pyrethroid in where they're burned down spray to take the cutworms out. They're going to clip the plants off at the ground level. Sometimes they'll come up and chew a leaf off and pull it down in a hole. They're going to hide in the daytime in the soil and come out at, at night and feed. They can thin the stand pretty quickly when, they're, when there are a lot of them in a field. And uh, they, they're feeding on the winter vegetation and when we, when we burn down, if there's very much, when the plants come up, if we plant pretty close to burn down, they're going to be out there and they're going to feed on those soybean plants when they come up. Generally not a problem. To my knowledge, I don't know of anybody that's had to spray cutworms when soybeans were planted behind wheat. Larry, you may have, but I, we don't know of, I don't know of anybody. Um, but they're generally a problem on the stronger ground in the bottoms. <coughs> Thrips can be a problem on soybeans. I've seen them booger them up somewhat, not near the problem they are on cotton. They'll stipple up the leaves like this and they can uh, gnarl up the leaves somewhat, but again, they're not the problem on soybeans that they are on cotton. I have seen people spray for them, though, when they do this much damage and the beans are drought stressed. You can sample for thrips on soybeans with a, a notepad like this, or you can put your handkerchief down and sample for them, shake the plants over, and, and look for the little oblong uh, insects crawling around. three corn alfalfa hoppers is probably the, the pest we have the least amount of information on good thresholds, Larry. We just don't have good thresholds, especially on seedling soybeans. Immature stages uh, are going to feed on down the lower on the plant than the adult. The adults are going to feed up high, so you're not going to sample the immatures with a with a sweep net. Okay, you're going to miss them, uh, but you will pick up the adults. They'll all, they'll both be out there simultaneously once the, the adults have been out there a little while and they've had time to lay a few eggs. Three corn alfalfa hopper is going to girdle the plants. Uh, the, the worst type of injury is where they girdle the main stem and the plants fall over. They can also girdle the lateral branches and the leaf petioles. This uh, feeding on the leaf petioles and the pod stems interferes with photosynthesis and the flow of nutrients to developing seed. This is the uh, the problem you'll notice sometimes you'll do this with equipment, sometimes you'll do it when you're sampling, you'll walk through the beans, the plants will fall over. You have enough of this happen, you think, the farmer's going to think, uh-oh, my consultant messed up. So the consultant has to make sure he doesn't see very much of this or he could, uh, he could have some problems with his grower. It's going to break off pretty smooth when it's three-corn alfalfa hopper. And this girdling damage that they do, when they're out there feeding on them, it takes a while after the feeding occurs before the girdling, this, ad, these, these are adventitious roots is the terminology that's formed around this girdle on the, on the stem. It takes a while for that to show up. You, you tend to have more three-cornered alfalfa hoppers uh, where there's a lot of ground cover, just the opposite of what you have in thrips in cotton. In thrips in cotton, if you've got wheat, uh, a lot of ground cover, you don't have as many thrips as you do in uh, conventional tillage, but in with respect to three-cornered alfalfa hopper and soybeans, they tend to be worse on soybeans planted behind wheat. Um, as soon as these soybeans start to come up, I advise you to go out and start, start sweeping them for three-cornered alfalfa hoppers. And again, we do not have a good sweep net threshold for, uh, no state does for seedling soybeans. As I said earlier, the adults feed higher on the plants than the immatures. Uh, they, they, they create about the same number of girdles. The nymphs prefer the stems. The adults prefer the petioles of the leaves. 
Here's one threshold we, we see, I believe this is in Georgia, 10% or more of the plants less than 10 to 12 inches tall are infested. Uh, how do you know that? You, you, you don't really know how many plants are infested. You go out and look for them, they're going to move around the plant like a squirrel in a tree. So you got a, a sweep net's the best way to sample for them. If you're picking up uh, 10 or 15 sweeps and they seed in soybeans, I'd be concerned. I can't tell you that, I, I guarantee you a yield increase if you spray, but if you, if you don't spray it that many, and they start falling over, you may have some issues down the road. What was that threshold again? I don't have a threshold. <laughs> when you said you were concerned when you found how many? I think, I think uh, in talking with the consultants who are on top of this more so than the researchers, in my opinion, I'm going to say 10 for 15 sweeps is a good, on seedling soybeans, and it, Eddie, you may even need to look at it at seven or eight because, again, we do not have a, any data that correlates to, uh, numbers of three corn alfalfa hoppers in sweep nets uh, in seedling soybeans and how many girdle plants that leads to or if that leads to a yield increase. Some of this, this is in Louisiana, I've heard my, my former counterpart in Louisiana say that you know you have to have 50% of the plants girdle before you have a yield reduction. And they've, seen, they've got data over there indicating that. But now if you've got 50% of the plants girdle when they're small and the wind gets up and blows half of them over, I mean, you know, I don't think you'll get hired back to scout that farmer's field. Uh, we also, I have some data, uh, some strong data indicating you can get a yield reduction just from three corn alfalfa hoppers in large numbers feeding on, on soybeans and starting at the R5 stage. Uh, we have a low threshold of one per sweep. We, we've kept that, but I would not spray with just one three corn alfalfa hopper on once they get in the reproductive stage. I'd like to see maybe two to three per sweep at least. But by the time you get in the reproductive stage, these soybeans, you're gonna have other pests out there to consider. And so, <laughs> yeah, I think the kudzu bug is gonna replace the three corn alfalfa hopper as our primary early season pest on, on soybeans here pretty quick. Uh, damage from three corn alfalfa hoppers most likely when you're, uh, the plants are less than 10 inches tall. Uh, consider the, uh, the three corn alfalfa hopper once you get in the reproductive stage as part of your pest complex, but don't be too concerned about uh, getting a, a big yield loss. The yield loss I saw was four bushels per acre when I had a lot of them and I treat them in R5. But I was, I had, uh, I think I was averaging three per sweep, but some, one week I sampled I had as many as nine per sweep. They were real heavy. Uh, But just keep in mind that this pest can cause you damage when soybeans are in the reproductive stage. And there's some of my data where I had sprayed versus unsprayed. I had a four bushel yield increase, and that's with eight replications per treatment in Tuscaloosa County in a field with 50 foot plots, eight replications per treatment. Even the buffer rows had a yield reduction. I sprayed them three times to knock, try to get them out of the field, knock them back. I did a pretty good job. I used pyrethroids will knock them back. But they tend to move back in the field, especially early in the year. They're starting to, in the fields right now, and talking with the consultants, they're starting to pick up a little bit, and uh, you need to, in, in the earlier planted beans, you need to keep an eye on them because they may be uh, starting to build some numbers. This is a this is a South Alabama pest that occasionally shows up here, and I'm going to talk about it so that if you run into it, you'll know what it is. Uh, lesser cornstalk borer. It's a very, it's a kind of a bluish purple worm. It jumps violently when you put it in your hand. It'll just jump up and down or flip around. Uh, they're going to get in the spur up into the stem of the plant and kill the soybean plant. They'll come out of the top of the plant when it's rainy weather and there's water in the soil. They'll come right out of the top. They'll kill a plant, it'll look like this, it'll, it'll just wither down and die, kind of like it's had a disease problem. And they're going to, in sandy soils, they will take their uh, silk, their silk threads that they generate and mix them with sand and make these tubes below the soil surface and that's how you can, you pull up a plant and you see this, you got less corn stalk borer. Again, they'll be in sandy soils in dry weather. They're not gonna be a problem in wet weather. We've had, a report of peel bugs damaging soybeans. I've only seen it one time, my, and I didn't know for sure that's what was causing the damage, but the farmer made pictures at night of them on the plant. This was in a black belt soil in Montgomery County. There's the damage that they were doing. 
I've never seen anything feed it and do that kind of damage. Some of the literature says that pill bugs only feed on decaying matter, so that's why I'm a little cautious in saying for sure that that's what's causing the problem. But the, uh, the farmer said that they were up on the plants at night feeding on them. And I didn't get by there at night, I got there in the daytime. But he sprayed with the pyrethroid and replanted and uh, had success. And there's the, they kind of thinned the stand and ate the tops out of a lot of the plants. Bean leaf beetles, you'll always see a few bean leaf beetles on soybeans uh, scattered around. Uh, it's been about three years ago when we had some problems with them in Lawrence County enough to spray for. We've been able to kill the bean leaf beetles with the uh, pyrethroids. We haven't seen the resistance issues that some of the people have reported in other states. Uh, if you have a bean leaf beetle problem, be sure you use plenty of water and get your pressure up to get them get down in the plant and make sure you get a good, good, good coverage to get a good kill on them in, uh, in pretty good sized beans. On seeded soybeans, they can really mess up your stand, uh, can take out a lot of the foliage. And here's the kind of damage that they'll do. And I saw some of this this year in some of my test plots over at Crossville. If you, had, uh, this, if you had this kind of damage across the field and you were picking up a good many bean leaf beetles, I wouldn't have a problem with you spraying. Seedling pests, as a general rule of thumb, you wanna, you wanna treat when you think you may have 10% stand loss from whatever they're doing. And on defoliation, uh, you don't wanna let it get too high, but it's probably gonna be around a 30% area, just like it is on uh, 30, 35%, just like it is on on beans just before they get to the reproductive stage. Pod worms scare me to death. I've, uh, I've had one situation where I thought they really messed up a field that I was looking at for a farmer. Uh, but they're, I've noticed some, sometimes you'll find these things near the tops of the plants early in the morning and as it warms up they'll crawl down and you're going to pick up more when you sample in the morning because of that. Uh, if, if we, of course this is $8 beans and so I need to increase that, but from 1.7 to 2.5 per row of foot, that's the economic injury level that's, that some states go with um, on pod worms if you're sampling with the ground cloth. Usually on average, the research that's been done, we see about a 2% reduction per larva per row foot. Dr. Ron Smith, we use his research to base our economic threshold in Alabama. Uh, his research indicated you, you lost about three quarters of a bushel per acre for each infested larva per row foot. And that's the value of that at today's price of soybeans as of last night. So the, the, for other states, I think have gotten to uh, using pretty high thresholds, as many as four per foot, is that uh, sometimes soybeans can compensate for pod damage sometimes they don't do as good a job. So that's why you need to be, with $13 beans, you don't need to, to, uh, to let these things gnaw away some of your pods and hope they'll come back. Our threshold is one per row foot with a ground cloth or three for 15 sweets between blooming and pod maturity. The smaller the pod, the more pods a single pod worm will damage. They'll eat the bean out of the pods, what they're gonna do. Little, a little pod worm will eat a little bean in a, small, in a newly formed pod. A bigger pod worm will feed on a bigger pod and get the bean out of it. Need to keep in mind that with a drop cloth, you're gonna get about two thirds of the corn earworm larvae. And if you, if you have three per row foot, that's equivalent to about 19 to 20 per 25 sweeps. And that's close to what our threshold is. Uh, one, per, one per row foot or three per 15 sweeps. And they can be a little bit clumped in the field. I've noticed in some fields at times you'll find pod worms, you may take a, a sample with a ground cloth especially, not pick up many, and you go down 10 feet and you take a ground cloth sample and you'll pick up a lot more. So you have to keep that in mind. So I always like to show this slide for some of the research that was done by Thomas in uh, Missouri in 1972. What he looked at, he looked at different levels of defoliation here from zero to 100% defoliation and in combination with zero to 100% depotting. Here's defoliation on this axis, depotting on this axis from zero to 100% on defoliation, zero to 100% on depotting. He looked at different combinations of defoliation and depotting at different stages of development. So if we look at what he, what he found with uh, 
Soybeans with the pods were 3 sixteenths of an inch long. If he had 33% defoliation, which is right about here, and no depotting, and you go across, you'll see about a 15% yield loss. If he had 100% depotting at R3, right here, but no defoliation, he had about a 5% yield loss. Now let's move a little further along into the plant development and see what occurred. With, with seed just beginning to form in the pods, seed are an eighth of an inch across. With 33% and no depotting, he had about a 25% yield loss. But with 100% depotting at this point in time, he had a 70% yield loss. At 100% depotting, he had a 70% yield loss and no defoliation. So the, the later in the year you go, the harder it is for a, a soybean plant to compensate for depotting. The easier it is, the further you go in, into the year, the less likely defoliation is going to hurt you. Okay? So, and once the beans are, are work pretty well filled out, if you lose all the leaves, it's not going to hurt your yield. But they need to be completely filled out. Talk about stink bugs. We, we mentioned earlier about the life cycle. The eggs hatch in five days. Uh, 30 days is immature, is going through five instars. Uh, once you get them in your field, they're going to be there pretty much the rest of the growing season, up to two months. Their, their life cycle is a little bit shorter than a kudzu bug. Kudzu bugs a little bit longer. They lay their eggs, they're barrel shaped eggs laid in clumps. They'll be with green stink bugs, they're this color, and they'll turn a little bit pinkish before they hatch and the immatures are going to aggregate it together, producing their uh, pheromone that, that smells bad and keeps predators away until they get a little size on them, then they'll move out and separate out. There's a pretty good slide of a green stink bug adult and an immature. There's a southern green stink bug that we don't, well the milder winters, we're starting to pick up a few more of these this far north, but they're, they're usually less than 5% less than of the population. But that can change. Things change with insects. There's a southern green stink bug immature, and you'll notice it's got a little pink on the outside margin to separate it from a, an in, immature brown stink bug. There's a brown stink bug that's a little harder to kill than the greens. There's a rice stink bug. You'll pick those up sometimes in, in soybeans and cotton too. It's got pointed shoulders like a predaceous stink bug, but they're pointed upward and not outward at a, a right angle, like they are on predaceous stink bugs. This is a red banded stink bug that we're picking up in uh, Baldwin County now. This, we picked it up for two years. It's probably not going to be a pest up here because it has trouble getting through the, the winters. The weather stays warm, it may be a pest. Uh, they lay their eggs in rows like they lay their eggs in rows like kudzu bugs. Red shoulder stink bug is similar to red banded stink bug, and we, we picked it up uh, in East Alabama along the Georgia line. And there's early instar red shoulder stink bug immatures. They're pretty unique looking, zebra like. Brown marmorated stink bug, this is, the, this is the stink bug that down the road, and based on what we're seeing in other states to our north, this is going to be our next kudzu bug. It's going to take it longer to become a pest, but it's going to be a pest, a very serious pest on our fruit crops and then our soybeans and cotton. And uh, I've got a slide I'll show you in a minute. It shows you how it looks compared in, in size-wise relative to other stink bugs. Here's the immature stage. We pick this up occasionally now. It's just taken it a while to get established in the, in the state. And they, they, come, they come in a lot of times on vehicles, in vehicles, and it's just a matter of time. I, I can't say how long it'll be before it's a, it's a serious pest, but it'll be here one day. There's a slide I like to show. This is a predaceous stink bug. This is a red banded stink bug. This is a red shouldered stink bug. This is a brown marmorated stink bug, and this is a brown stink bug. And I forget, this is something, this is a stink bug that gets on trees. It's the biggest one we could find next to a brown marmorated, but give you an idea of the relative sizes of these different kinds of, of stink bugs. I thought that might be helpful to you since I don't have <coughs> specimens to show you. I'm passing around some kudzu bugs that you might want to look at too in a minute. Uh, 
Treatment threshold on stink bugs is bloom to mid pod fill, one for three row feet or two for 15 sweeps. When they're feeding on a little bean in a pod at this stage, they can do more damage to the pod than they can once the pod gets a little bigger and the threshold gets a little bit lower. We go to one per row foot or three for 15 sweeps. We'll talk about uh, kudzu bug now. It has several different names. Uh, this insect first showed up in 2009 in the Atlanta, Athens area. It, it's very good at overwintering. Some say it's better at overwintering than the boll weevils were. They'll get under pine bark, under leaf litter, and in the attic, stink up your house. So get out the caulk, kill your kudzu near your house to slow them down. Here's some pictures that Ron Smith made this week at Auburn. Uh, they're going to be on the main stem, and the, you'll see them on the leaves, but uh, you just don't see them on the pods. The, the adults, and there's some more adults on the stem. I'm going to show last year's slide. This is the slide I showed you last year when we had this scout scoop. And this is where we had found them about this time last year in Alabama, okay? And then this is May, and you can add five more counties to that. We haven't, we haven't, done, we haven't collected them from Madison County but we, and, and collected specimens, but we have picked them up in Madison County, so you can add, add Madison. Last year we had them in 15 counties at this time. Now we have them in all but 13 counties. So they're moving fast. And where they first showed up in 2011 along the Georgia line, people are, are spraying for them. Uh, we've had reports in Talladega County of a, a pretty serious infestation on seedling soybeans. And people, people are going to have to treat for them. It's going to affect our subsequent problems too because we're going to have to spray for them and kill our beneficials. As further south you go, the more likely you are to have a worm problem from spraying anything on soybeans. There's another good, good picture, show you how they, their size. And you can look at them in the vial and, and kind of get a good feel for how big they are. Here's the immatures, and I've got a container that's had some immatures in it that I collected uh, on June the 11th, so they're kind of, kind of nasty. Those, those are from uh, Auburn. Those were planted about mid-April in uh, the immature stage. There, was, there were some immatures out there last week real small ones, but they're flat bodied and they're hairy and nothing else looks like them. But they look a lot like aphids when they first hatch out. They're actually orange when they first hatch out and then they turn green after the first molt. Uh, eggs hatch in six days and then the larval stage is from egg to adults about six to seven, six to eight weeks depending on the temperature. Right now it should be about six weeks as warm as it is. But the, the immature stage is uh, once you start having immatures, you usually have a whole lot of them on the plants. There's a, another close-up of the immature stage. You can kind of see the fuzzy outer portion of the insect. And there's the eggs. They're laid in a double row. And at Prattville last week, we had a lot of them. I, had a, I was running about six for a sweep in some knee-high beans. They weren't, well, they weren't knee-high, they were not quite knee-high. And I started a test, t test there to try to see how much yield loss we can expect for them and how to manage them. There's another slide that Ron, Ron took. With, the eggs look a little different there. They're, they're, they're not exactly in the rows. Prior to this year, to my knowledge, we hadn't really had uh, major issues with these things on seedling soybeans, just when they come out of the ground, small beans, but this year we have. And um, last year when we went to the, to the field day over at Blackwell, South Carolina, Ron and I went, they were talking about trying to wait till you had immatures in the field before you spray. This year because they seem to leave their overwintering sites and go to these early planted soybeans right off the bat and reproduce, they modified their, their guesstimate as to what the threshold would be. They had a little bit of data indicating that if you infested seedling soybeans with, with these things uh, and put them in a cage at V3 stage, they would shorten the heights on them. So they've gone to a threshold now on seedling soybeans, a foot or less, five per plant. And we were seeing that at uh, 
at uh, Auburn in the early planted beans. Not quite that many at Tallahassee, uh, not Tallahassee, but uh, there are a lot at Tallahassee and there are fewer at Prattville, but they were uh, enough at Prattville that I, was, I felt like I needed to go ahead and put in a test uh, to see what they would do. Again, the problem you run into when you spray them in this stage, there's more coming off the, the kudzu over time and you may uh, have to spray again. Uh, the question arises at this point in time on these early planted beans, have we seen most of the migration and did we want, at Prattville for example, we had a lot of uh, adults and, and a good many eggs but we didn't have any immatures and so can you wait till those immatures start showing up and those eggs start to hatch before you can spray and not get a yield reduction. We'll show you some data that's related to that in a minute. Uh, this is a good test that was done uh, at, at, at Midville, Georgia. Uh, this is near the South Carolina border. Uh, this is the untreated where they didn't spray at all and uh, this is the number of kudzu bugs per 20 sweeps over time. And you'll see that they're running in, on the first sampling date they're running 11 adults per 20 sweeps. By the 24th of August they're running 342 adults per 20 sweeps and they're picking up uh, a lot of immatures. Where they sprayed every week, they cut 50.3 bushels in this particular situation. And here's the untreated beans, about a 13 bushel yield reduction. Where they sprayed at one bug per sweep, they reached the threshold here and here. This is adults plus immatures. If they had a total of one per sweep, they sprayed, so they had to spray twice. Cut the same as, as the, where they sprayed every week. Where they sprayed with two bugs per sweep, they sprayed one time and they cut 47 bushels. When they waited until they had immatures present and one, uh, one bug per adult per sweep, they cut 48 and a half bushels. And when they just sprayed at the R4 stage, they cut uh, 51 bushels. So they were able to hold off on spraying these things until uh, it, and give them one shot and pretty well protect their yields, even though uh, they did manage to numerically to cut a few more beans, that statistically there was no significant difference if they could sprayed at uh, the threshold of one adult per sweep and immatures present. Which going into this year, as I said earlier, that was a threshold we'd hoped to be able to use, but because there were so many on the little small soybeans this time, they changed that out of fear. Soybean lippers were a bad problem for us last year. A lot of the acres in the state were being, were being sprayed for loopers. You can identify loopers because they have two abdominal prolegs. These are the anal prolegs. All these caterpillars will have three uh, prolegs in the front of the body. Then the, the number of abdominal prolegs will vary. We're going to, on foliage feeders, we need to prevent 35% defoliation during pre-bloom. And once you get uh, greater than 20% defoliation, we want to treat from pod set to maturity. I would, I would stick close to this from pod set to maturity because that's sometimes when you get to that level, if the weather's right, you may see a yield reduction if you get, get much above that. Uh, roughly five to eight soybean loopers or bean caterpillars per, uh, per foot of row will get you to that threshold. Treat when you catch an average of 1.5 worms per sweep. We have a lower threshold for loopers than we do for uh, green clover worms and, and other foliage feeders. We go with, uh, one, with 0.75 per sweep. We count the loopers twice. Uh, some states don't do that. Last year, I was trying to get an idea of how, how many loopers it took to get some pretty good defoliation on soybeans. If I was getting one per sweep in one field, on average, I was running 5% defoliation, and about five days later, I was picking up two per sweep, different size worms, and I had 10% defoliation. So um, that's... The best I can tell you right now is how many worms you're going to see with a sweep net before you see defoliation at those levels. Um, but that's a good threshold, 1.5 worms per sweep. I like that threshold. Before you go out in the field, you may want to look at a picture that gives you a good feel for the different levels of defoliation uh, that you may be looking at and, and, and kind of uh, get, get these in your mind as to how much defoliation you actually have when you have 20% defoliation. To me that looks like more than 20% defoliation, but that is accurate, okay? Also when you're looking at defoliation, you need to look at the top 
the middle and the bottom because with loopers your defoliation tends to start at the bottom and move up. So you may have more defoliation in the bottom than you do at the top. That defoliation at the bottom, as a general rule, is not going to hurt you as much on your yield as the defoliation on, on up the plant because those leaves are shaded. Again, you look at the number of abdominal prolegs to, to distinguish my, our main pest, some of our main pests in soybeans, caterpillar-wise. If you look at a green clover worm, it's going to have three. And I did see a field last year where this species by itself did defoliate soybeans. So it can be a bad problem. And I think uh, one of our consultants here sprayed for some of these up in Tennessee last year as the main problem. Velvet bean caterpillar is going to have one, two, three, four abdominal prolegs. Podworm is going to have four, and it's going to have more hair on it than a fall army worm which has less hair on it, it's a little slicker, and, uh, but they look, they look very similar and easily misidentified. But fall armyworms can feed on pods as well. And yellow-striped armyworm on soybeans planted behind canola can be a, an issue. I've seen that happen where there was enough yellow-striped armyworms to spray for, but disease took them out right after we sprayed, so I don't know if we gained anything by spraying or not. But viral disease took them out. And, uh, Velvet bean caterpillars did these in South Alabama. They can really defoliate beans in a hurry. Bean leaf beetles can uh, graze on pods, and sometimes they'll eat all the way through this outer layer and let water get in and rot the bean. Mexican bean beetle is another insect that will defoliate the leaves. You may see this in the field. And this is uh, different color phases of blister beetles. I always like to show this slide to remind people not to, not to handle this booger because it's, it's the one that kills your horse if it gets in the alfalfa hay and they eat one of them. It produces the cantharid and your horse will be a slobbering laying on the ground and dying and it'll die from these things. It's a, it's a rough insect for horses to eat. Different color phases. They're usually clumped out in the field feeding on the foliage, and uh, that's kind of, when they get on you and you mash you, gets on you, mash you, uh, you can get blisters, hence the name. On these double crop beans especially, we're going to see uh, complexes of insects develop. You may have subthreshold levels of stink bugs and uh, kudzu bugs and caterpillars, but you put them all together, you may want to clean them up. And a lot of people, when they put out their fungicide spray, add a pyrethroid to their mix and and clean their insects up, keeping in mind that you may open yourself up for a, a looper infestation. Last year we were able to kill soybean loopers in North Alabama with a pyrethroid. We would get 50 to 75 percent control. We do not recommend uh, pyrethroids for soybean loopers though uh, because uh, they have developed resistance to pyrethroids and you may put it out the second time and not kill very many of them, but uh, if you do spray loopers with a pyrethroid, check close behind them, and if, in three or four days, if you haven't killed a good many of them, you may want to go ahead and spray another product and take them out. People got away with it last year, but I don't, I'm not sure you'll get away with it this year. Uh, just, just giving you a heads up on that issue. Um, we're, we're fixing to start planting soybeans now behind our wheat, and with moisture, they should come up growing pretty fast and get ahead of everything. Uh, we hope that the kudzu bugs are not going to be an issue in this part of the state this year. They're generally worse on early planted soybeans as a general rule, and since most of our beans are wheat beans, hopefully we'll, uh, we won't have to spray them for kudzu bug, and we can wait until August and September before we have to spray anything for insects at all until the three corn alfalfa hoppers leave them alone. And that's just a picture of some some, a pretty agricultural spot in uh, North Alabama. Anybody got any? Questions? Anything that they want to discuss before we go to lunch? Yeah, Mike, I got a question. You didn't mention it. What about the Demolin boron spray at R2 or R3? Is that effective up, up here in North Alabama? We haven't seen the yield increase that y'all get in South Georgia. And I don't know why we don't see it, but we just don't see it. We see yield responses from Demolin when we have caterpillars that the Demolin will reduce. The, you know, two ounces is generally what people go out with. And we'll, we'll do a pretty good job on velvet bean caterpillars and green clover worms. Part of your yield increase in South Georgia was likely tied to that benefit because you tend to have a higher velvet bean caterpillar population than we do. 
But even where we've done the work in, in South Alabama, we haven't seen the the ten percent yield increase that y'all see. It just it's just it's not there for us. And we've done a lot of tests. But I liked with the kudzu bug, I like to see people consider using demolin in areas where if they're spraying uh, say at the bloom stage on those beans, you're spraying over over once you get in the reproductive period because you're gonna start picking up some worms. And that demolin will give you pretty good residual control on velvet bean caterpillars and green clover worms. And if your loopers aren't real bad, demolin's not gonna do much for your loopers at that rate. And I can't tell you how high you gotta go. My counterparts say it takes a lot of demolin to be effective on soybean loopers. But it's not demolin's not gonna help you on the immature three corn alfalfa hoppers. It's not gonna help you a whole lot at two it's not gonna help you very much at all on loopers at two ounces. So your main benefit's going to be on velvet bean caterpillars, which are mainly further south, Montgomery South, and on green clover worm up here, which last year we had green clover worm contributing to our defoliation in a significant manner. So uh, if you get a yield response from Demolin in Alabama, it's probably going to be from caterpillar suppression. That's what our data shows presently. I just, just curious. <laughs> yeah, y'all have a lot of data showing, and y'all, you know, I've read, talked to Philip, and it's. Uh, it's a good treatment down there. And I've, I put it out down in South Georgia when I was down there for 18 months, and it did a good job, and I, I had a lot less defoliation on from velvet bean caterpillars. Any other questions? Gerald. Happens a lot. 